Welcome. Amazon best-selling author Leslie K. Barry is most recently a screenwriter, author, and executive producer. Her previous professional work includes executive positions with major entertainment companies, including Turner Broadcasting, Hasbro Parker Brothers, Mattel, and Mindscape Video Games. Leslie grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, attended James Madison University in Harrisburg, Virginia, Harrisonburg, Virginia, and now lives in Northern California, where she is raising her family. She has a strong connection to the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area known as the DMV, as her 95-year-old mother still lives in Maryland. Her mom's side of the family, however, hails from New Jersey. Leslie's daughter is a singer-songwriter who lived in Nashville two summers ago and wrote the theme song for the audiobook of Newark Minimum, which I believe we heard before. Um, that is where the connection comes between the DC, Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, Nashville. The hardcover edition of Miss Barry's book can be purchased at Scrawl Books in Northern Virginia, and we will post that link online later. Welcome, Ms. Barry. Thank you very much. Um, I am so excited and honored to be here and be, to be talking to everyone across the country. Um, and uh, I, uh, I guess I'll introduce Brissell, who's, um, who's going to be interviewing me today and uh, talk about the way Rizal and I met was my book, Nork Minutemen, um, is about men, Minutemen, who you'll learn about, who are these boxers in New Jersey. And uh, after one of my talks, um, Francine Levine called me and she said, <laughs> your book, his name is Benny Levine. And we started going through some background and then she introduced me to Rizal. Rissell. So I'm going to turn it over to Rissell right now to start it off. Okay. I am thrilled to be here with you tonight to interview about your fascinating, inspirational, and important historical um, novel, Newark Minutemen. The only thing I want to add, because I know a lot of my people are coming, I'm not a spiritual leader. Generally, I'm a spiritual leader for Temple Israel of Highlands County. So um, I'd like to get started with you, Leslie, and ask you to tell us about the story of the Newark Minutemen. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, Newark Minutemen, it's, um, it's a lost story in our American history, and it's really tied to the beginnings of fascism in America. And uh, it happens, the setting is, it happens during the Great Depression, well before World War II. Um, so Newark Minutemen is a, a sort of historical romance meets crime fiction, and um, it is based on my own family uh, true story that my mom helped me research. And it's this mix of action over this very violent period in our history in America, which was the Great Depression, where we had this divided America, which we all might be able to relate to today. So that's sort of this backdrop. Um, but combined with the action is this drama. And layered over it is a love story. And it's a, it's a star-crossed uh, love story, but, um, but uh, and, and I'll go into that more. So, so you have this mixture of, of, of drama and, uh, and, uh, and, vo and uh, action. And what I'd like to do is actually give you a quick trailer just to give you some visuals and a sense of the story. And I think then it would be easier to, to um, relate to. So I'm gonna hop into that. And look it's
ocean flow I hear they're coming soon But I never have to fear You're the angel in the room Just don't close your eyes To the black end of tonight We're fighting for our love But they're running for our lives Just free Hopefully that gives you a, a flavor of the story, but it is a love story and it's the star-crossed love story, sort of like Jack and Rose from the Titanic or Romeo and Juliet. And it's set in New Jersey in the Great Depression in the 1930s. Across this um, forgotten or little known backdrop, uh, which was the rising German American Nazi party in America during the Great Depression um, right here on American soil. And so the story follows a Jewish boxer, his name is Yale, and he's part of a group of boxers called the Newark Minutemen. Um, and that was organized back then by the Jewish mafia and our government to go up against the Bund. And so Yale goes undercover for this as a sort of a resistance in New Jersey. And along the way, he falls in love with the daughter of the enemy. So, um, so it offers this dramatic perspective of one of the biggest untold stories leading up to World War II. And uh, actually when writing it, I sort of discovered this um, portrait of the American 1930s that revealed some of those responses uh, of America toward fascism. So thinking about the 1930s, November 9th and 10th, in Germany was Kristallnacht. And here we are in the United States about the same time, 1938, November 9th and 10th. And it was considered, as I say, the beginning of the Holocaust. Um, so much was happening. And, and in America, we were shocked. They wrote how they were shocked in the newspapers, but the outrage soon faded and, uh, even Roosevelt waffled November 11th when he was asked at a uh, press conference, well, did he have anything to say about uh, what was going on? And he said, um, no, I think not. You had better handle that through the State Department. So a lot of consternation was going on, but nothing was being done excepting what we hear about in your book. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell us where did this story come from? Because it is a historical novel. So are some of the people actually real characters, real people of those times? And are there other characters that maybe are fix fictional, but they're, that are based on perhaps right. real people? So great question. And first, um, just to give you some context of, um, so you gave some great context and you hit right in the, 
in the bullseye about what was going on at the time. Um, and what, what was happening in America was because of the Great Depression, we had sort of this triple threat going on. We had, a, uh, we had an economic crisis going on that lasted a lot longer than we thought. We had these aggressive dictators across the ocean. And we had this, as I said, this divided America. And so it was this fertile ground for alternatives to democracy. People were like, this is not working. What do we do? And so they started looking in different directions and um, they looked left and, you know, there was this part, communist, communism was a party and they looked in the middle and that was a lot of FDR was doing a lot of, you know, socialistic programs where the government supports, props up the country. Um, and then on the right, we had fascism. And um, what happened was uh, this shadow party was filling this great divide that we had. And it was sort of actually a, a Hitler satellite called the German American Bond. And it, this story is the story about the forgotten resistance fighters that were organized, as I said, by the Jewish mob and, um, and our government to defend our country. And so I had never learned about that at school or heard about it. And growing up, um, I'd heard little pieces about, of course, the times, but what happened was about, so my mom's 95 now, and five years ago at her 90th birthday, my sisters and I said, okay, let's get 90 people here to come to her, her 90th. And we reached out, went on Ancestry, found all the old cousins and friends. And um, so she grew up in, in Newark and we got, we got all of them there. So my mom grew up in Newark and, you know, daughter of immigrants, four older brothers, cousins lived on their street. I know, Rizal, you have a similar background. And so we heard all these stories growing up um, about, you know, the, the depression and the war and, and my aunt was even part of the underground and I had a cousin who escaped Auschwitz. And, and, but then they started talking at, at this party, they started talking about my mom's older brother, Harry, my uncle Harry. And they said, um, you know, they, they were talking about when he was a prize fighting boxer and we'd all heard that story and we'd seen the golden glove and we saw the newspaper. But they also said um, to my mom, they said, Esther, do you remember when Harry used to come home at three o'clock in the morning, all beat up and your mom would say, what are you doing out there beating up the Nazis? And I kind of like did a double take. And I said, what do you mean beating up the Nazis? You mean when he went and fought in the war? And, and they're like, they're all started saying like, no, no, there was this Nazi party here. And your uncle Harry was part of this group of boxers that would go out and, and uh, sort of divert them. If they, if there were, um, uh, if they were having meetings, go undercover, get information. And, um, and I started becoming possessed uh, with this story. I'm like, I'd never heard this. And so I started doing all this research and I found, um, I found these FBI documents that her, have only recently been um, um, unsealed actually, relatively like 10 years ago or so. And it was all the FBI documents of, of meetings and interviews with the Bund leading up to the war and, and through the war as well. And I started finding all these archives and putting this whole puzzle together um, in one of the most valuable pieces of, of information was this incredible, I was actually on Ancestry and I was doing some research and um, I, I, was, I, I had found out this story about these two brothers in Chicago. One was a newsman and one was a, um, an FBI uh, 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 he worked for the FBI and he was part of the Dillinger, bringing down Dillinger. And those two brothers worked for the Chicago Daily Times and went undercover for six months to, um, to find out about this, this party that everybody was ignoring and it seemed threatening. And, and so they went undercover for six months, got so much information, and then they wrote this 14 day serial um, in the newspaper about what was going on. But the super interesting part about that is when I was on Ancestry researching that, I saw a footnote that said, all of the diaries of the Metcalf brothers are at Hoover Institute. 
which is over here at Stanford near me. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go check it out. And so I went down and it's this like an archive, like you picture, you go down underneath and they take all your stuff from you and, and you very carefully bring out one box at a time. And what was amazing was I found 14 boxes of diaries, incredibly organized diaries of the brothers of undercover, um, of their undercover mission. And um, um, I ended up getting a hold of actually the son of John Metcalf and he's like, use it, use it. And I ended up crafting these scenes in the book that are based on some of these shocking scenes in America. And there's even this one scene, for instance, um, where Yale is being initiated into what's called the OD. It was like their form of the SS, the inner circle military group. And um, he had documented the whole initiation rites um, of becoming an OD member. And for instance, I use that in the book and uh, bring it to life. My goal with the book was to make it as authentic as possible. And you know, you asked the question about which characters were fictionalized, which were real. Um, and uh, again, my goal in trying to make it authentic was, I always tell people like about 85% is true. The rest is, is a fictionalized love story and, and imagining um, some of these other things that went on. But basically, um, Longies Willman, who's the head of the mob, he's true. If you're Fritz Kuhn, he's the head of the German American Bund, he's true. Um, all of the boxers, all of the Nazi <laughs> workers, everybody, they're all true. Your dad is true. I know, I, I loved to see every time, A, B, A, B, A, B. I was like, oh, there's my dad. Benny Levine, Francine's dad is true. Um, Nat Arno, who was sort of the lieutenant who would train these guys, he's true. And Yale, who's the, the, the hero, my Uncle Harry is, is Yale's best friend. And I, I kept him to the side because I wanted to be able to sort of have a grounding of him as a character and, and play around more with Yale. Yale is based on John Metcalf, the person I just talked about from the Chicago uh, newspaper. And his girlfriend, Krista, is actually based on um, a real girl. Her name was Helen Vrurus, who um, um, I'll go in a little deeper into her later, but um, she was, uh, she testified later on at FBI hearings um, about what was going on at some of the camps. And so I've based my heroine on, on Helen Vrurus. And I talked to my mom like every day for like two years. So all those little details about how her mom picked up the fish and all that, that's all true too. <laughs> Why couldn't we stop what was going on here in the United States? Well, what I wanna do is I first wanna give you an image of what exactly was going on. And I have a clip and this is real foot, this is taken from real footage and there's lots of this online. This is just a short little clip, but this is real footage that takes place um, six months before Germany marched on Poland. So it's here in America, it's in our Madison Square Garden. And um, you'll see the, this American Fuhrer, the American Hitler he called himself, um, he gets, he fills up Madison Square Garden with uh, his, his followers, the German American Bund followers, and they call it Der Tag, the day to create a Nazi party in America. So I'm gonna share that clip because I, it was chilling to me. And then I'll, I'll talk about why we couldn't, we couldn't stop this when it was right in front of our face. So, um, February 20th, 1939. Just months before Hitler invades Poland and ignites the deadliest war in history, thousands of Nazis gather for a rally at an indoor arena. 
But this is in Nuremberg or Berlin. This is Madison Square Garden in New York City. You all have heard of me through the Jewish control press. And the man speaking isn't a member of Adolf Hitler's inner circle. He's Fritz Julius Kuhn, a U.S. citizen and head of the German-American Bund, or association. Kuhn wanted a rally to celebrate George Washington's birthday. The first American fascist is what they called him. They signed a contract with Madison Square Garden. Said, okay, we agree. No swastikas, no anti-Semitic signs, none of that stuff. Of course, once the contracts were signed, those agreements went out the window. This program was produced for the German-American Bund rally. We love him for the enemies he has made. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Fritz Kuhn. Kuhn then went on to deliver a, a very, very predictable and very, very typical National Socialist stump speech about racism and the Jewish conspiracy and the communists and how everybody's an enemy and everybody has to be alike. We, the German-American Bund, organized as American citizens with American ideals and determined to protect ourselves, our homes, our wives and children against the slimy conspirators and the parasite end of Jewish communism in our schools, our universities, our very home. Then. So, um, so that was right here again, Madison Square Garden, New York City, and what this uh, Fritz Kuhn, for, if you're Fritz Kuhn, he was the head of the party. He divided our country up into three. And in fact, um, they called us the colony. And it, there was this hierarchy with uh, hundreds of cells with, um, with groups of people wearing smuggled in Nazi uniforms, training. Um, he created a, uh, six company corporation. Um, one was the, the, or the, these groups that trained, one was a newspaper, one was actually a real estate company that um, he, uh, there were 25 pieces of property across the United States. And what he did with those was he turned them into Nazi youth camps. And he taught the children the ideology, they wore the uniforms, they spoke German, um, they, uh, they trained, some of them trained with guns that were stolen, not stolen, our, at the time our NRA, you could go and get free guns. So they would use our, our NRA uh, guns. Um, so, so all this was going on and, and right in front of our face, I mean, these guys are marching down our avenues, filling up Madison Square Garden, but we were, it, we, we were a divided country. A lot of people wanted to avoid war but the bottom line was we had First Amendment rights. And so we couldn't, we couldn't do anything. So at the time, our government said, how are we going to solve this? And so um, remember, let's, let's go back in history. It's, it's the 1930s. In 1929, there was a stock market crash. Everyone lost their money. Who was left with money and power? The mafia. We had the Italian mafia and the Jewish mafia. And so our government went to the head of our Jewish mafia, Meyer Lansky, and um, they said, listen, we need your help. We'll pay you. And Meyer Lansky said, don't need to pay me. Just look the other way. And, and uh, they came to an agreement. And so Meyer went over to his buddy in Newark, Longies Wilman, who was the head of the mafia over there. Um, and uh, I think our, our uncle's fathers worked, worked for Longy. Um, and, uh, and Longy put together a group where he would train and pay these boxers uh, to go out and, as I said, be a resistance group, whether it meant um, breaking up meetings, going undercover, uh, taking pictures of stuff that was going on. And uh, they were called the, the Minutemen because at a minute's notice, they could get one or five or 10 or, or whatever to go out. And um, your dad, my uncle, Francine's dad, um, they were all the, uh, 
uh, the NORC, the NORC Minutemen. So tell us a little more about where these guys came from. What was their, their background from their ancestry? Yes, let me, uh, actually I have, um, let me bring up here, I'll talk over this. Um, I'm going to have to, I'm going to skip ahead. Well, while I'm here, sorry, jumping around. These are some of the images actually from the camps um, that were, like I said, all across our country, um, the Midwest. So who were these guys? Well, mm -hmm. at least my uncle, and I think your dad as well, um, they were either born in Russia or, or their parents were, were or, or Europe and, uh, or their parents were, and they were tough guys. They were, they were, they, they had fought either their parents or, or, or families had fought um, horrible things in Russia and, and Europe to get here. When they got here, they were tough guys. They were poor. Um, they weren't allowed in, in colleges, most of them. And um, I don't know, Rizal, what, what it, you do you want to add to that of who was your dad? Well, my dad probably was born in um, Vilnius and brought here as a baby. And the thing with my dad was that um, his father unfortunately died from an ear infection when my father was six and my father was the eldest. So he wound up having to go to shul uh, to say Kaddish for his father. And then um, my grandmother got my father working papers and he, got him a job at a roller bearing factory when he was 12 years old. And when he went to work, there was a bully there. And the bully used to tease my father and say, hey, A.B., you're gonna go to shul today, A.B.? And he kept at him. And one day my father, who kind of felt like a nothing, had had it and fought it out with this guy. And believe it or not, he knocked him out. And his friends took him and took him to the, the Jewish Y and he began to train to become a prize fighter. He was 12 years old, he was five feet and a hundred pounds. And from that, he grew to be, um, to fight for the light heavyweight championship of the world at Madison Square Garden. He wound up actually knocking the German middleweight champion out in January 2nd, 1929 in three rounds, which he was proud of and I am proud of. And um, boxing became his sense of self-worth. And he was very close to all of the, the other guys, as tough as you say, they were, Leslie. I know that those guys would kiss each other, hug each other, cry together. So when they went into the ring, it was like you have to fight to kill your mother if, it's, if your mother's there. But out of the ring, it was a different story with them. And um, I know they were part of different wards in, in Newark. There was the third ward, which was the Jewish ward, and the first ward, which was the uh, the Italian ward. And I, I know of one fight at the velodrome between my father and Vince Dundee, which was called a draw. And both of the, their supporters felt that each guy had won and they tore the stadium down. People, people were hurt and the stadium had to be rebuilt. So that was kind of the world from, that my father grew up in. Yeah. Here's some of the, um, so here's some of the pictures. This is really Longy, who they, all the boys worked for because there was no other job. And my mom, you know, if you ask her, you know, what was Longy like? She, she's like, oh, he was Robin Hood. He took care of us. He took care of the family. And, you know, of course they had, uh, they had the, you know, they were tough, of course, guys. And they didn't, they weren't, as we would define it, that had maybe the same 
code that we have today, but it was a different life back then. And um, if nothing else, they took, they took care of the neighborhood. And uh, it was interesting. One of the th big things I took away after doing this was this new respect for how the mafia actually propped up our country during the 1930s. So that, that's actually Longy. And I, people always ask me, this is in development of a film. And they, they say, do you have any dreams for the film? And I think he totally looks like Robert Downey Jr. So I'm gonna reach out to Robert Downey Jr. when, when it's time. Um, so this is a picture. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I just I'm want you to get a sense of, these were ragtag boys. These were <gasps> ragtag boys. Um, the one uh, is your dad is the one in the- The well, good looking oh, one. <laughs> the good looking one, um, right next to the lady. Uh, so if you're looking at the screen, he's to the right. That was my dad. Yeah, yeah very young there. And this is interesting. So all the boys wore um, Jewish stars on their shorts. And uh, the, the, here's an example of one. Um, this is my uncle and the article about him winning the Golden Glove. There's Abby Bain, that's Rissell's dad. And then here's just a, a montage of, of others. Uh, Benny Levine is the one, um, let's see, can I point to it? It's, uh, that's Benny right there, if Francine is on. And these are all examples. And I have this gallery on my website. I tell, um, I tell people if, you're, if your dad or uncle was a Minuteman, send it in and I'll put it in the gallery. So I've gotten different pictures. This was a picture of one of the, uh, um, I guess, riots that went on. And this picture of these guys here, Nat Arno, the one with the cigar, he was, he became sort of uh, Long East Wilman's captain. And he was the one that really organized um, the Minutemen. I have to say my father remained friends with these guys throughout his whole life. Yeah, no, they all remain tight. And, and uh, um, you know, it's been really interesting meeting the, the legacy, you know, the people that hold the legacy, both the Nork Minutemen people as well as the sons and daughters of, of uh, some of the mob back then. Um, so that's, that's kind of who those guys were. All right. So um, do you have any summary that you would like to give to us about that um, revenge, unholy alliance, forbidden love? Well, to me, um, I think two two things I, I I sort of take away from this story. One is about legacy and um, this incredible value of learning your legacy and where it came from and and what it make you here today and and what you might pass on because of that. And the second is about um, complacency and um, not to be complacent because, uh, you know, we're getting a taste of this today too. If you just sit back and are silent, we know the quotes that, you know, when, when your turn comes around, there'll be nobody to speak up for you. So, um, so that's sort of my, my takeaway of what, what I hope people get as a message from this story. Can I, can I read something that goes along with what you're saying? Sure. This is by Yehuda Bauer. Thou shalt not be a perpetrator, thou shalt not be a victim, and thou shalt never, but never, be a bystander. And Elie Wiesel said the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. Exactly. Yeah. So oh, I think that's it, unless we have some questions that people would like to ask of us. Thank you so much, um, Rissell and Leslie. Thank you so much. Um, I am Erica Danziger from the JCC of Northern New Jersey, and I'm here to help you with questions. 
I do not need to be spotlighted, my friends. I'm here to help the group uh, who, who might have questions, who would like to give reactions. This was a very helpful presentation, a very interesting story. I see Marilyn is clapping, well done. And we'd, uh, we would welcome questions and comments and feedback that you may have. Um, I'll start with one we see in the chat while you're gathering. And if you want to raise your hand as we're wrapping up the question, I'll come find you. Um, what, what was surprising to you, Leslie? I, I see you, Arnold. No problem. You're next, my friend. What was surprising to you wh about when you were researching your book? What did you find most surprising? I think the biggest surprise to me were the youth camps. I had never ever heard of, of anything um, like that. And, and I mean, these were real youth camps modeled on Hitler's youth camps. And the goal was, there were two goals. One was um, to, uh, to have a little German soil in America. And the second was to, um, I'll use the word, indoctrinate the younger generation. And, you know, when it goes to kids, it's, it's hard because they're going to do what um, your family, you know, your culture is about and, and their friends are, are all together. Um, so I think that was what, um, like, it's the sub, I mean, the whole thing shocks me, but if you really ask about something, and I, I did mention also this whole incredible, um, uh, economic, um, economic and power base of the mafia that I didn't quite understand. You know, like like you guys, you all probably, you know, we watched The Godfather, and that's the image I had of the mafia. But you know, really getting into it and talking to my mom about who was Longy, and she goes, "Oh, he would give us money and candy on Halloween, and my brothers worked for him, and he made sure we were all okay, and he helped get cousins out of Germany." And, um, and it was a time, it was interesting because it was not only a divided country of um, people losing faith in our democracy and so looking other places, but what was amazing to me was the, um, even our Supreme Court was divided. And what that meant was that when things were taken to the Supreme Court around this issue, like First Amendment rights, they couldn't make a decision because it was split down the middle. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the government had to go elsewhere around the law. We didn't have law. We couldn't have law because nobody could come, could come to an agreement. So, um, so that was interesting. And then probably the one other thing that struck me was, so in the twenties, there were all these fractured groups because after world war one, um, you know, Germany, obviously we all know how hard a time they had. And, and a lot of the, a lot of Germans came to America. And so there were these fractured groups of some of them, not all of them, of course, some of them were believed in Nazi idealism, but it was fractured. And it was in the thirties, the thing that really made it skyrocket was radio. And because all of a sudden there could be one message communicated to many millions. And even though it was a minority and people will argue, well, you know, there was only 25,000 or 50,000 or hundred thousand of the German American bond. Well, guess what? There were half a dozen other groups out there too that were in sync. And once you had radio, just like kind of the internet, mm -hmm. you, um, you, um, unified this movement and there were charismatic leaders. So I guess it was, you know, even, even when there's a minority, if you have a charismatic leader and a way for them to communicate, be careful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are certainly reflections of, of what we see around our world, not only here in the US, but I would say some of what you're reflecting reminds me of the challenges the Israeli government is having right now. Mm -hmm. um, Arnold, I, I come to you next. You can unmute yourself. We'd love to hear your question or your comment. 
Uh, I was just wondering, is it going to become a movie? Well, uh, it, <laughs> it's a good, it sounds like a darn good movie to me. Oh, thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put you in the movie for saying that. <laughs> I actually- <laughs> It's a great movie. I, <laughs> and it's so apropos for today. Exactly. Yeah. All pieces, it really does. I yeah. actually pulled the movie first. Awesome. I am um, just being out from California, more of our connections are more in the movie business. And so I actually sold the screenplay first to a group called Fullwell 73. Yeah. And they are four um, Jewish guys from the UK. And their fifth partner is James Corden, um, who does the Late Late Show. And um, they're a, a really like sort of up and coming group. And um, I mean, they've, they've already done some great things too. But uh, we've got writers and um, we had a director, a really great director, but because of the pandemic, his movie got pushed out a year mm -hmm. and we might still go with him, but we are talking to uh, another great one. So mm -hmm. um, hoping to do that. And I am really fighting for it to be filmed in Newark. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, just as a background, my, my dad was a boxer. Oh, well, he was probably a Minuteman. And he, he <laughs> well, he was in Salt Lake City, so a long ways away. So. <laughs> but he did go to New York and he, and he fought in the Golden Gloves. Mm -hmm. So many Jewish but boys. But he ran out of money and he had to come back to the way. <laughs> <laughs> he won. He kept winning, but he couldn't, couldn't stay. He ran out of money. <laughs> oh. Wow. I guess boxing didn't quite pay enough. No, I didn't pay anything. Rizal's dad became a consultant for movie boxers. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, dad finally uh, worked with Anthony Quinn and lived with Anthony Quinn while he was making Requiem for a Heavyweight. For a heavyweight? Oh, it became a more pathetic, poignant characterization of my dad's, his mannerisms. My dad talked like this. <laughs> because this was it this was he it hit? well actually he did get hit and what happened is that the the vocal cords became kind mm. of flaccid but then also they wanted to give him more uh, stamina and so they had a doctor and he cut off they cut off his uvula so he didn't have a uvula either oh god so, you know, there was, you know, a lot of crazy things in that time. They didn't have the same restrictions of weight. So my father fought uh, Tony Galento and Tony Galento was 232 and my father was 163. Yeah, right. And Tony Galento caught him with a punch on his hip. He got a blood clot on his hip and that became a war wound so that later in his life, instead of walking straight, that leg would kind of shuffle. shuffle. Mm. Mm. Yeah, my, my dad uh, got his ribs busted by a guy. <laughs> I think they had and ribs his nose, busted a lot. He, could take, all he could take his nose and stick, stick his finger on his nose and, and push it all the way down. Oh my, sounds like a real boxer. I think um, boxer. Francine may have had a comment or a question she wanted to ask. Francine, would you like to Francine. unmute yourself? Did you have a question or a comment? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, oh okay. Actually, yes, I'll let Judy go because she unmuted herself. And then Francine, I'll come to you next. See if you can find I did, that. Unmute button. I did put something in the chat room. Yiram obviously is from Newark. Was she a week like high school graduate? Was was my mom? She yes. definitely she was. She was class of forty four. Okay, and, because my sister, who might be watching, was class of forty six, oh. and class of fifty three, uh -huh. and we had an uncle who was, from what we all heard, was not a. I don't believe he was a boxer, but he was part of a group that, basically, attacked a bond meeting in Irvington Center. That was probably this group. Suppose, yeah, well, I know it was. Supposedly, it was written up in a book by Warren Grover. I don't know if you've read his book, but it's called yes. Jews of Newark. Yes. And he does feature this. So, yeah, there is a lot of history. 
very yeah. interesting and I'm still consider myself a Newark girl. Yeah, no, it's such a community and wonderful. Yeah, I, it's amazing to hear these well, stories and everybody. Was mother, what was your mom's maiden name? Levine. Oh, so that's, that's the connection. Okay. Well, my sister might have known her. We'll yeah, have... so they all lived. Uh, so she lived on Hawthorne Avenue, which was a big street for oh, everybody. And that's where uh, that uh, Cohen's Knish is. They I know it, and I knew the Cohen's. And I went, to, uh, <laughs> I went to school at the Annex, which was on the corner of Hawthorne and Clinton Place until you went to Weekway. Oh, yes. Yeah, she went to Hawthorne Elementary. Was that? Yeah. No, I went to Maple Avenue, but Hawthorne Elementary also had a segment that was used for freshmen at Weekway because the school was very crowded. You Got did it. your freshman year and then you moved. So yeah, we knew it well. Yeah, she can sing that song, Week Walk on the Hill or something. You're not pronouncing it right. <laughs> Week Walk. <laughs> That's all right, we forgive you. Sorry. Yeah. The wigwam on the hill. Wigwam on the hill, right. Exactly. Yeah, we do remember. Well, it was, it was good times. So really, thank you, Jean. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank really. you, Judy. Thank you so much. We have a question in the chat, and then I'll come back to you, Francine. Um, Jack asked, did, did Fritz Kuhn ever use the sermons of Father Charles Coughlin of Detroit in his speeches? Well, I, I believe they collaborated quite a bit. I mean, um, I, I, I'm sure. I can't say definitively, but I know they shared idealism. And what they also shared was, um, so Father Coughlin had the radio show, Fritz Kuhn had the mailing lists. And so they would collaborate for marketing where for, they would send out to a million, they had a million mailing lists to all the, for the radio show and vice versa. So they were definitely tied together. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. That's satisfying, Jack. I see him nodding. Excellent. F Francine, I'm going to click um, asking you to unmute. Let's see if that helps you. Are you able to unmute and ask your question? She's still, uh, she's still muted. I see. I see. I'm trying to help her. I see it. Give her a second. All right. While you're still looking, um, can you, uh, can you tell us, uh, Leslie, what happened to the Bund? Were they shut down or did they morph into what is now some kind of white supremacy group? So what happened was that scene that you saw at Madison Square Garden, that was uh, George Washington's birthday in February. And then six months later was when Hitler marched on Poland. So all of a sudden, A, America started opening up their eyes to um, maybe, maybe what's going on is, is truly a threat. But what happened to Fritz Kuhn, who was the leader and the most charismatic leader of the Bund, was, um, again, they couldn't get him legally uh, to stop. But what they did was they got him on fraud and, um, and tax evasion. And six months later, he found himself in jail because of that. And once he was gone and some of these other things started happening, the German-American Bund at least started falling apart. And then the FBI who, during the 30s, the FBI was just beginning to form its, itself and they didn't really become super powerful in terms of infrastructure until as the war ramped up and so, um, but by 1940, the bun was falling apart because they had lost their, their charismatic leader and Americans had started becoming uh, more aware. And there was actually another, there was a movie that Time Warner did. What was it called, Time Warner back then? Warner Brothers, I guess. Um, Confessions of a Nazi Spy. And it was in America, we'd actually caught some spies and uh, the DA that had worked on the case went and sold his movie to Warner Brothers. And um, so between these things, it started uh, fracturing the, um, the momentum behind that party. And, and people had, then people had to choose, either they were Americans or they went back to Germany. 
And uh, so a lot of them did. A lot of those leaders did go back to Germany and become, um, you know, some of the leaders over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. My, my name is Paul. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes. What I wanted to tell you is that I was born in Vienna. And uh, when Germany came into Austria, uh, one day I was on my, in my uh, bed looking out the window and I saw a man on the street getting uh, hit. Um, and it looked like it was something that was going to take place throughout Vienna and possibly also Austria. So I, I got the hit. Fortunately, 1938, we decided to leave Austria and came to the US. Fortunately. Yeah. No, that's your book, your book sounds fascinating. Thank you for Rizal and Leslie. I, I, I see that my dear friends. <laughs> Morris Morgenstern. <laughs> Paul was actually one of my students. He wanted to learn how to chant Torah. So we worked on that and he's chanted Torah a number of times beautifully. How very, very special. <laughs> Francine, I'd love to come to you for our final question of the evening. Okay, it's more of a, of a statement than a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, Thank you. Well, okay, good. Um, I was just gonna say, I tried to watch it, like I didn't know anything about it and it was very informative and, and whoever didn't read the book should hurry up and do so because you're missing out if you don't. And how I met Russell, I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, those boxers were, before they were Minutemen, they were like a brotherhood, an unorganized brotherhood. They just loved each other, all of them. I mean, they fought like they were gonna kill each other in the ring, but they loved each other. And they could never run into each other 30 or 40 years later without hugging, kissing, and crying. And as soon as I'd see my father with some man with his arms around him crying, I'd go, oh, mom, there's another boxer, right? She said, I hope so. <laughs> um, but they had come to, anytime her dad came to Newark from California, he'd stop and visit us oh. and see my dad. Oh. So he told him he was doing a lot of extra work in movies. And uh, Rissell had looked like she was going to have a promising career. And she was with him. I don't know how old you were, how old I was, something like I was nine and you were seven or something. But before he left, he said, oh, and by the way, Russell just shot a movie. They think it might really be do well. So keep your eyes open for it. It's called The Ten Commandments. <laughs> they thought it might do well. Yeah, so anyway, the movie comes out and, and naturally it's like immediately a tremendous movie. And I go to school and I'm telling people, see the little girl with the basket? I know her, she was at my house. <laughs> Do you think anybody believed me? <laughs> well, they'll believe you now, Francie. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But then it was a pleasure to meet her then and it's a pleasure to see her now. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing us You're together. Yeah. Oh, it was my pleasure. You also did a great, we a thank great too about, just real quick, you know, about didn't your dad go to Longy's funeral? Was it your dad? Um, he might have, but I don't know about a story about it. Is he buried next to him or? Oh, he, how did you know that? It's his uncle, it's his longest brother. Yeah. How did you know that? You told me. Oh, I did. I wonder if he does not too many people know that. I thought, <laughs> it was a very strange coincidence. <laughs>